on the August 2024 What's Neat. In this month, we're going to talk about a lot of great stuff, including a great layout construction segment. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at broadway-limited.com. Roca Prototype Models, we make it real. Check out their website at www.rocamodels.com. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for August 2024. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month we're going to talk about a lot of great stuff, including a great layout construction segment. We've got Matt Stern coming on this month from Bachman Industries to tell us about all the latest new products. We've also got Dr. Robert Steers from Roca Models, who's going to share with us a, just a lot of beautiful tank cars firefighting tank cars, just a multitude of colors. The segment that he did is fabulous. Also, we do layout construction where I've been working on that new diorama on my layout. This will be part three. It's that construction uh, repair facility that I'm building, like a complex for working on earth moving equipment and construction equipment. And this month we work on the parking lots and the roads. We bury the track in the dirt. We build a loading area for loading vehicles onto flat cars. It is again, part three of layout construction. And I do it real time so you can sit with me and actually watch how it's done step by step. Broadway Limited Imports this month has announced 3751 in N scale with Paragon Force Sound. That beautiful, famous Santa Fe locomotive that they in fact was an excursion service. It's such a beautiful model. They're also creating number 3759 as it appears today. They're also creating 3756, 3758, 3759, and 3761 as if they were in service. You can check out all these beautiful N scale variations of the 3751 class locomotive at Broadway Limited Imports.com. And before I leave you, I also want to tell you Broadway Limited has also announced this month a multitude of N scale. F units and F3s and F7s. And I want to go through these briefly because the road names are beautiful. The Atlantic Coastline A and B units are available in N scale with Paragon 4 sound, Chesapeake in Ohio, the Clinchfield, the Electromotive Demonstrator units with a B unit to match, the Lackawanna Railroad, the Gulf Mobile in Ohio Railroad with a B unit to match on that and the seaboard lines, number 4023. Now for the F7s, they're creating the Amtrak pointless aero paint scheme, AB units both, and this beautiful Santa Fe yellow bonnet F7 with a complimentary B unit to go with it behind it. Burlington route, check it out. That's beautiful with a B unit. The New Haven and Cotton Belt. So there's a lot of exciting things. Again, check it out at the Broadway Limited website. And one more thing I've got to bring up. This is very special. We have a new What's Neat This Week boxcar. Check that out. I have not shot this outside yet. Uh, this is absolutely beautiful. The work of Derek Sampson. Value Trains USA is the name of the company. And you can check out this freight car at his website at www.sampsonrchobbyshop.com. So that's kind of neat. 
brand new What's Neat boxcar. How exciting is that? And so with that, be sure to check out the What's Neat This Week video podcast that we shoot down here every Saturday night, keeping you updated on what's new in the hobby with all of our special guests, our regular podcast crew, and a lot of great interviews. It's just a show. It's Hobby Shop Banter 101. It's perfect. And so with that, let's continue on with the rest of this August 2024 What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, we're going to continue on with this wonderful diorama that I've been building now going on two years it's a slow process but we've covered every step this is going to be part three in a series of videos shooting and on the last video that we shot we showed how to build this amazing building that went really well into the scene the coloring the windows the treatment we laid the track on the diorama and planned out kind of sort of what type of a business would go here and or could be pulled out and another building dropped in for video run bys. So therefore we're going to create a lot of cement aprons, a lot of a base for this building to set atop of, and we're going to go through the entire process up to ballasting and, and putting the dirt the track inside the dirt on that one portion of trackage that's going to run right through the grass. So let's sit back, enjoy this. You can fast forward through some of the clips as you are going to be with me down here in the studio real time as I do this process. So enjoy this next video segment on What's Neat, building this beautiful cool diorama part three. Now starting to work on the foundation of the building, I've laid out forms, about one eighth inch square pieces of wood. I've carved down the foam using my uh, Stanley Shoreform planer and multiple saws. And I use the levels to make sure that the placement of each one of these pieces of wood across and diagonally are level so that when I pour the cement in the middle of these forms and smooth it with the trowel, it will be a level surface for the building then to reliably sit on top of and look just about right in the scene. I'm also transitioning the area from the approach road down to where the building's foundation will match. So I've got a gradual roadway, not an abrupt change or a steep incline. I also still think I might want to build something here, maybe some railroad ties, and bring the transition of the cement up to the same height as the flat car to make a loading area we could roll things straight onto flat cars from the side. So at this point, I'm going to mount the wood with some steel pins, vacuum clean all this mess up, and then pull out the cement. smoothing on the first coating of this concrete mortar repair mix from DAP. Once I get this initial amount of material down, then I'll wet it with this water bottle and we'll pull a big trowel across it and make a nice smooth pad here.
we're at here. just a little bit more material here than what's necessary and drag it out. So you don't experience any deep dips. Okay, just like this. Which I would call perfect. I wanna clean up around the edges and just let this set up now. So while the pattern of the building sets up, which is gonna take at least 24 hours for that to cure, I'm gonna start in this area where the track is going to be buried into the cement right here for a loading area. And I've got it all, again, formed with the uh, scrap uh, wood that I have here that's about an eighth inch square. So we're ready to go. I've got my water, I've got my trowel, I have all the material here. The width of the main trowel that we used before will work here. It'll fit perfectly and lot, slide on top of the wood which is at the same height as the rails. So this should be textbook simple. So I've got this second slab of cement all smoothed out, this uh, asphalt or cement or whatever this is going to represent after I color it. And I went through an entire container of this uh, concrete and mortar uh, repair mix. So this is how much area that one container will cover. I've still got to make the approach roads and the parking lot and the roads all around where the building's going to be. But at this point, these sections need to be left alone. Again, they need to set up for at least 24 hours before we come back with a second coat to fill any cracks as it shrinks and it starts to dry. Cure. I've decided to install a railroad tie retaining wall on this part of the land where I envision being able to have an area where a flat car can pull up and the pavement will come up level with the side of the freight car. And it'll add a little bit of more interesting, uh, something different to a scene here, but yet totally functional to the scene if they wanted to load this from the side and that drive up the equipment on the end of the flat car.
I cut some more of the eighth inch quarter wood stock here and made some forms so it approaches off of the road into an open parking lot right here or an open area before it gets to the building which is represented here by this foundation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this pour next and then I'll do a follow-up pour after it cures, after a day goes by and I'll make this pour bringing it up to the levelness of the loading dock which isn't that much of an incline. I'll feather out the cement and then I'll figure out how to do this at the end of the tie wall. But at this point, it'll be an interesting little scene into the scene of what we're building right here, and it looks like it'll be quite functional as well. I like to hold down our forms around the cement work using these push pins, which are about two inches long. I found them at Walmart. I've been buying them the first batch about 12 years ago, and I just had to buy new ones today. And what I do is I push them into the wood to hold the wood into place. And then I follow up with a pair of wire cutters, flush cutters, and I cut the heads off and catch the balls if you can. And what that does, it allows it, the boards to be held in place tight, and at the same time, I can run the trowel smooth over the top of the wood without the bumps of all these little pins. So that's how I do that. I'm going to cut the rest of these pin heads off and start laying cement. So now that all of the uh, cement is set up overnight, it's been a good 18 hours. Um, you can see there's a lot of cracks in it, which is what happens when this material dries. And then we're gonna go back over those cracks and patch them with a smaller trowel. But first I've gotta remove all of these wooden forms that are holding, uh, that held the cement in its position. And the way you do that, the cement sticks naturally to the uh, wood. And so what I want to do here is I use this painter's knife. And this is a fantastic tool. I've used it for so many different things. But I get in here while the material is still just a little, it's still a little soft right now. So I'm easily able to put this right next to the piece of wood and hold my straight edge. You want to take this slow. There's no fast way around this. Because if any of this cement sticks to the wood, it could tear off a chunk of cement, which we'd have to go back and repatch. And then once it's loose like it is right here, I simply pull up the forms. And then I go in and remove the pins that didn't pull out. So I've got to do that to this whole area. Fill in the patchwork where the cracks are and then fill in these other additional areas around the building. I use an old hacksaw blade that I cut in half to make it shorter and I sharpen the end of it here to like a knife chisel point. And what I do is I take this uh, hacksaw blade and I clean out the flange ways where the track work here is now inside underneath the cement area, underneath the asphalt. And then I use the chisel point to clean out the inside of the rail. And it just takes time. You just work it slow. The material is still soft enough that it's workable, which is good. So here you can see the cracks that get into this cement due to shrinkage. And it's simple, you just take a putty knife, I'm using this painter's knife again. You 
you just fill these cracks. And we put on a little water. And just make it smooth. I'm sanding down the area here, getting all the rough edges, any imperfections off. I'm using this uh, garnet sandpaper, uh, medium emery cloth. Uh, it doesn't have a number for the uh, breakdown of the grit here, but it's kind of a uh, fine to a medium uh, sandpaper and it's black. You can't use red sandpaper on the cement work like this on the asphalt because it'll color the asphalt red. The, 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 gr the garnet, whatever's mixed in to color that, will ruin the effect. So by using black, I don't have any problem at all. So I'm going to sand this out, vacuum this up, and then we'll get to the point of putting India ink on it to give it that uh, asphalt looking effect. Now using a one inch paintbrush, I'm going to apply the India ink to the pavement here to give it a color, a darker color. One coat is all I want, and I want smooth strokes so I don't streak it. This India ink jar, this stuff can last for years. I've been using this one now for going on five years since you saw me build roads a long time back. Same mixture, same jar. It lasts forever. You just put a few drops of India ink into the alcohol, into the rubbing alcohol, and it creates your mixture. So I'm gonna dip this brush now into this India ink, and I want smooth strokes. Just like this. There's no magic to it. You just want one even coat over the entire area. You don't want to double stroke it. You don't want to put two coats of this on as we do this. So I'm going to work this whole area all the way across here the same way. And we should have a very believable looking colored pavement here. Just like this. I've applied ballast to the area next to the uh, pavement, and it's level with the rails. So it'll make an area where vehicles can drive over the level track area to help with loading if there's a loading situation where that needs to be done. Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement is the best mixture I've found for gluing down ballast uh, in that it's got a wetting agent in it and it soaks into the material without bubbling up. Everything's still smooth as can be right now. And that's what I want. So I'm gonna wipe up the excess off of the uh, asphalt here and let this dry. Now I'm starting the ground texture following up. I've already put some ballast down here next to the asphalt and this is glued solid. I've now put a ballast here, which is ground up, sifted, screened, limestone right off of the driveway. On the main lines, I'm gonna put down Woodland Scenic's gray ballast. And then on the siding here, as this continues, this Code 55 track, this gets really covered in dirt. So it's virtually just gonna be track with grass growing through it as it is here on this part of the layout. So as I put the camera into position here, you can also see that I've taped over the switch points on the microengineering turnout because I do not want any, uh, any glue or any dirt anywhere near that turnout in that spring because it will affect the performance of the turnout. Now what I've got here is backyard dirt. 
This is just sifted fine dirt that's been sifted through very fine screens. And I'm putting that down around the track that is literally going to be covered in dirt and grass. There's no magic to this, just an even coverage. Now I'm going to use an artist brush. I use a fan brush. My two favorite artist brush for doing ballast is a fan brush and a straight brush. It's a little bit curved off on the end. And that's absolutely perfect for smoothing the material between the ties, off the rail sides. So I'm going to continue to work this and then put down the gray ballast in here. After everything is glued with Woodland scenic, scenic Cement and while it's wet, we'll follow up with some static grass. So we'll be able to have some grass growing through the trackage areas as well. Okay, so I've got the ground foam down, I've got the light gray ballast down. The limestone ballast, I got dirt, cinders, scenery material is ground foam, very fine mixed turf and light green and dark green Woodland Scenics uh, medium turf. And now I've got the static grass gun ready to follow up on this part where the track is buried in the dirt where I want to have grass growing. So I've got my Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement mixed up here in the bottle. I've got a piece of cardboard to protect the wall. And the goal is to very carefully and lightly spray the glue on without disturbing the ballast the way it's been laid. And I'm going to start right here. And work my way through. I'm spraying it straight down on top. I don't want the ground foam to move. I'm using a brand new sprayer set on the finest setting. I've got the turnout covered up with tape so I won't get the switch points glued. And I'm spraying straight down there. And I want to soak the area liberally. I want to see the white of the glue so that I know everything is soaking in down through the dirt and down through the thick rocks. Some of this might be up to an eighth of an inch thick. But so far this is going perfect. So let me finish doing this and let's see how it turns out. Now, while the glue's wet, I want to use the static grass. I've got some light green in here, not very much. I'm going to turn this on and just put down some grass on this and have it standing up. I've got the clip in the wet surface so that it creates the charge. And look at that standing up, it's magic. Absolutely magic. Just like that. So with the glue dry, the trackage that's in the grass, I need to take an abrite boy abrasive cleaner and go over the top of the rail and the inside edge of the rail to remove any of the uh, static grass and the glue from this track area that's buried in the dirt as we get to enjoy a train running by as we work. How fun is that? So I'm going to do this and clean all of the track 
and then go ahead and test run a set of switchers through everything just to make sure everything is clean and everything runs. But up to this point, what we've got is all of the uh, scenery material is now dry. Let me pull this camera off of this tripod here. Everything is dry and beautiful. The areas that are secondary mains have got grass growing in them. The area of the cement came out smooth with the gravel rock next to it to help it continue in the event they want to drive or ride something over it. Um, the track work in the grass, like I said, is looking dynamite. All of the ballast goes into the switch yard now. So we've still got to drop in block wires. There's still a lot to do, a lot of super detailing to do. Uh, I envision lighting the building with lighting. I'm trying to figure out all what I'm going to use for that. The loading dock area looks decent. It matches with the levelness of a flat car. And I'm going to build something over here. I'm not sure yet, but the area has been paved, and right now it's it's holdover area for the uh, maintenance uh, facility for this uh, construction equipment. So at this point, let's continue on and see what happens as we start to super detail and light this scene. So after everything's all set up, I put some vehicles out on the scene and I've got what I think so far is a really cool diorama in process. As you've seen, all the cement works come out good. The dirt in the tracks really makes a really nice effect that I like. There's a lot more to be done on this now. As you well know, it's time once you get the basic surface of any one given scene finished, you then want to start working on all the super details. And one thing that I do want to do to this scene is light it up. Um, I have not decided what type of lights to use yet, but as recent, I found these lights from Atlas. And these are some pretty neat lights in that they're sort of modern, which is been the tendency of this scene with regards to the equipment and all the models that are going to be on it. So I want to find a way to work these in, light the building. Uh, Mini Prince sent a scissor lift as a detail. I've got these vehicles from Neil Maltz at East Coast Circuits with all the neat lights on it. Maybe place a vehicle like that somewhere in the scene all lit up with some animation. Plus you need electricity, you need wiring. I've got some brass telephone poles that I've made from a previous diorama. I've got them test fit in here so I could get an idea of what type of electric the building would require after studying prototype, you know, wiring that's all around us. It's easy to then create that effect on the layout, which is neat. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to be done here on this scene yet, but this will be an ever-evolving scene. Something just interesting. It's a great place to display models. We've used this uh, cement pad right here for the podcast many times. So as well, I will continue, we will show and film for what's neat how this scene will evolve. I mean, I need signage, railroad crossings. It doesn't end. Signage on the building. Um, and it just, it's going to be so much fun. So stay tuned as we continue this segment, this continuation of this in the future. And that is this segment for What's Neat. segment of what's neat. I'm going to do a quick modeling tip here. This is the BTS Hide Pulp Mill Kit that we built on a previous episode of What's Neat. And in the July, or in the 2017 March video that I ran at What's Neat, I showed how I wired up and lit this entire scene, which came out really, really good. Well, today what I'm doing is I'm going through the scene and I'm replacing some of the lights where the masts had been broken off. There's one right here that's broken. And I just replaced this one right here on the end. And what I want to say about this project is 
the one thing I'm so glad that I had the insight to, to do seven years ago when I built this was to design it on a piece of plywood so it would simply drop into the scene and allow me to get to all the wiring and the light hubs underneath. Now sure, if it was a permanent layout not built out of foam, I could probably have all of this underneath and easily accessible underneath the one by four grid work. But because this is a foam layout sitting on top of tabletops right here in the room, all the way around the room, it was necessary for me to simply figure a way to build a cave system to encapsulate the both of the uh, light hubs that are right there with all the connectors that are going to all the little lights that are in the diorama. So I just wanted to say, I just think for future reference for anybody building a scene out of foam on a foam layout, build it so that you've got access to it. There's so many ways to go about it. But right now that I'm having to replace these lights, it, it's, I've had it out for one day because I've been actually looking at it, studying the groups of wires, and thinking about adding a few more lights to it. But I'm so thankful I designed it the way I did, whereas easy access, easy to get to, simple replacement of burnt out bulbs. Something to think about, and I definitely would consider that a layout tip for what's neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I'm with Robert Steers from Roca Models with some exciting brand new products on the market. I look at all these beautiful colors, Robert. Look at this. Thanks, Ken, very much. This is our, uh, our uh, third run of these uh, HO scale uh, uh, 16,000 gallon uh, tank cars uh, that were built by GATC starting in 1949 and ending in the mid 50s. Uh, a lot of different railroads had these. As I said, this is our, our third run uh, with all new lettering and railroad specific uh, details, accurate prototypical details that uh, uh, we think are, have not been done before and ready to run plastic. Uh, there are several things that uh, we, we'll be doing a lot of research on these, obviously. Yes. Uh, the um, These tank cars were for their day, they were huge tank cars, 16,000 gallon tank cars. Uh, and as they were replaced over time uh, with newer, bigger tank cars, uh, they were relegated to uh, uh, maintenance away service or railroad service. One of the things I found most interesting uh, is how they were converted for uh, fire service in the late 1980s uh, and early 1990s. In the back row, we have four that we're offering that are prototypically accurate. Uh, the, uh, the, the Black Santa Fe uh, uh, emergency fire car, there were two of these. We're bringing out uh, both numbers. Uh, as you can see, they have a special uh, tray that was welded on the car uh, that contained uh, basically an electric battery, electric motor, fire hose and all connected to the under, uh, excuse me, to the drain plug. Uh, they're all basically the same design, but the, all the markings and uh, liveries are distinct. So this Santa Fe car, for example, late 19, mid to late 1980s, and then it was repainted uh, in the early 1990s to this ATSF BNSF version with the really attractive red ends and white, uh, white uh, fire ends. Boy, that looks good in outdoor sunlight. Uh, they're really spectacular. They're, uh, they're sturdy. They're, they look delicate, but they're actually quite sturdy. Uh, and as I said, they're all prototypically accurate, including uh, 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 there were two of these red cars, yes. red fire cars, yes. Montana Division Fire Car. And there was also one of these, a BN version, Burlington Northern, that was dedicated to the Seattle uh, uh, the Seattle Freight Yard. So this is a fire car specifically for the BN that was assigned to Seattle, but you can probably imagine it was sent elsewhere. Other things we have in this same run yes. 
are uh, Santa Fe uh, tank cars. Now the Santa Fe had a lot of these. Uh, it was a class TKN and TKO, uh, delivered 1949 and 1950 respectively. Uh, this uh, yellow banded car is a one-off. There's only one of these on the railroad. It's for LIX or Lix Cleaner. Uh, prototypically accurate. All of these are with photographic evidence. Next is the Santa Fe uh, solvent car with the uh, yellows and red stripe variation. Yes. Four numbers of those coming out. And next is something that is I always found interesting was uh, this is a 1949 version of uh, a Santa Fe uh, fuel car that was dedicated to uh, streamliner, streamliner passenger service. So in uh, stations, terminals, uh, when these transcontinental Santa Fe trains were coming through with the new dies dieselization, uh, they had specific uh, fuel cars set aside uh, just for those trains. Uh, I mentioned just a minute ago that there's, there's a Montana. I live in Billings, Montana, so whenever a Montana prototype pops up, I usually take a lot of note of it. Uh, besides the Montana Division fire car, there's also uh, this uh, Montana Rail Link, former Northern Pacific GATC tank car uh, that a friend of mine photographed in the Helena, Montana uh, rail yard in January 2000, uh, 2021. So this is pretty recent going all, and then going back to 1949. Uh, this is a dedicated uh, car in, that, in the, the Helena yard, but obviously traveled elsewhere. Uh, dropping back to the Santa Fe just a second, we've got the silver Santa Fe domestic water cars. And during the droughts in the West, uh, these, uh, uh, the Santa Fe had dozens of these, and they would fill them with water uh, and take them to small rural communities. Uh, either for their own use or the, uh, the community's use, uh, but it was fresh potable water. The other silver car is an interesting collection of cars, again Santa Fe, that's a, a vegetation control car. And this is special tooling underneath that shows uh, the uh, uh, special piping for this, uh, this herbicide. Uh, and underneath it is a little sprinkler that can't see here, but there's a little sprinkler that's all attached up with a proper piping uh, that sprinkles the herbicide between the rails. Uh, again, this is photographically uh, demonstrated and uh, never be done, never done before in uh, in any scale that I know of. Now, something else we've done. Oh, some something else we've done for this run uh, are we think for the first time in in ready to run uh, plastic are these GATC 16,000 gallon tank cars for the Chicago Great Western, yes. but also for the Chicago Northwestern, which the CNNW inherited them. There are specific railroad details with these. If you'll notice, uh, the capacity of these cars, both the red and the, the blue, the light blue and the black, uh, their different colors meant they carried different different petroleum products or oils, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the difference is that on the, the end of the tanks, the so-called tank heads, there's a different curvature. Uh, that is, there's a two to one elliptical curvature, which increases the, the uh, capacity of these tank cars from the uh, 16,000 gallon uh, range for the Santa Fe's uh, and the Burlington uh, uh, BNSF cars to 16,400 gallons. So there's uh, very specific railroad details that we've invested in and added on to, of course, different railings, er everything of, of that note. Uh, these are, but one thing I want to point out, Ken, is these are, these are um, sample models. So there's a lot of things here we're going to change. Uh, little things, color of lettering, uh, color of the cars a little bit, perhaps. Uh, but as always, they're just a little little things that need to be changed here and there. The uh, Colorado, uh, excuse me, Chicago Great Western uh, oil car, these all were inherited by the, the CNNW uh, and uh, were painted black and used for uh, transportation of uh, uh, oil as far as we can sort out. Uh, one final offering is in this big run is 
a very plain but a very interesting car. It's a Burlington Northern uh, maintenance away car in uh, basically like a, a, a Rust-Oleum uh, sort of uh, red color. Uh, again, we have a great photograph of this car. It goes very well with the BN fire car. This was made for water on the, uh, uh, the BN maintenance away system. So in summary, we have multiple variations of the same basic GATC uh, 16,000 gallon tank car uh, design that started in 1949 and, and then uh, uh, as it evolved for different railroads, different purposes, uh, and uh, ranging from uh, 1949 to January uh, 2021. That's amazing. It's an Easter basket of colors and all the prototype research that you've done. I am so impressed with your thoroughness. Thanks. It's, um, I really enjoy hunting down as much as I can find about these, these prototypes. They're really very interesting. Uh, as you see how the, the, the railroads use this, this asset uh, to their, their special purposes. Uh, and remember, Remember that these these fire cars, these were uh, more than 35 years old when they were modified. So these cars were very robust. They were everywhere. Multiple railroads had them. And by the way, this is our third run of these. These are all new, all new lettering styles. Uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to a fourth run somewhere down the road because there are even more variations. So where can I order these freight cars from? Well, right now, these are decoration models. If you go to our website, uh, which is www.rokamodels.com, you can reserve these, no cash down reservation. Just go on our website and reserve it, uh, and you'll, you'll be in line to get one of these cars, uh, one of these models. Now, if you reserve it and you pay for it, then you get a 10% discount from the MSRP, which, by the way, is the same uh, MSRP as the first and second run of these tank cars. Uh, so we've, we've invested a lot of into these to get these prototypically right, uh, to bring interest and happiness and, I think, satisfaction to discriminating modelers who really are interested in uh, something that's a bit different, but something that's that's uh, dead on realistic and uh, highly detailed, yet pretty sturdy. That's awesome. This is gonna be a welcome addition to a lot of different layouts out there, Robert. This is the best hobby in the world with Thank some you, of the yeah. best people in it. I always say that. It's because of people just like you. Well, thanks. I really appreciate you having me in today. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to be back in St. Louis and pleasure to see you again. And thanks for looking at these with me. That's awesome. And that is this segment for What's Neat. Thank you. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got Matt Stern from Bachman Industries in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hey, Matt. It's awesome to have you on this gorgeous summer day. Ken, good to be here. So what do you got that's really exciting on the desk back there? All right, so um, we've got a few new things to show you this week uh, or this month. Um, most of it is, uh, it's, it's mostly uh, um, new paint schemes for uh, existing models, but uh, we've, got, we've got a couple of new things to show as well. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start off with uh, our HO locomotives here. Uh, we have a couple of new paint schemes coming in uh, our uh, GP40 line, which is uh, one of our favorites, especially for uh, early modelers, introductory uh, modelers. Uh, it's, it's a great, um, fun locomotive. Um, we've got a ton of different paint schemes, and we're bringing two more to the line now. Uh, nice. This one here is Union Pacific. Um, this is a little different to any that we've done in the past in that it's got the, uh, the Little Rock block lettering on it here, which uh, I believe was... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure the, uh, the, the the exact history of, of why that happened, but I know at the, the Little Rock shops, for whatever reason, they they had these stencils and they uh, they had a, they had a different font they were using. It looks good. 
So uh, we've got this one here. And we also have BNSF and the H1 scheme, yeah. which is uh, still very uh, prevalent on this locomotive type in reality. Yes. Um, this is, uh, I believe we've, we've made a few H1, H1 models before, but um, this was, uh, Tyler actually did a, a fantastic job uh, color matching here, and uh, they just, it, it looks really fantastic. It sure does. Gosh, the exciting colors. When those first came out, it was such a change. Oh, absolutely. And as a, uh, as a, as a great Northern fan myself, I, I, I definitely appreciated the, uh, the, the tribute to that scheme and the, and the Spain scheme. No, yep, you're absolutely right. Um, so then moving to our GP38s, uh, these are actually, um, at, at the time of airing for this, these should be in stock. Okay. Um, we are, we have a couple of new, uh, GP38s coming out. These are, uh, DCC sound red, DCC ready. Um, so they, uh, they're, they're, I believe they have an 8-pin plug in them. Um, you can install DCC on these locomotives. And uh, we got this one here, which is Amtrak Maintenance of, Maintenance of Way. Uh, it's wearing the uh, most recent iteration of the uh, the Phase 5 scheme before they moved to, uh, I guess, uh, it's Phase 7 now that they have on the latest Jeeps. Right. Um, but this was the version with the uh, with the white sill, um, which was the, uh, like I said, the final Phase 5 version that was uh, appeared in reality a few years ago. So we've got Amtrak um, with dynamic brakes, and then we also have Missouri Pacific, which I don't have on hand, unfortunately, because we only have a single sample. And uh, as we're shooting this, it's uh, it's off on its way to the show. So uh, nice. um, not not with me, unfortunately, but we also have Missouri Pacific in the beautiful Missouri Pacific blue, um, and that one is a, a non-dynamic brake version, which is actually the uh, the first of that um, configuration that we've uh, done in that line. No, that's so true. They did not have very many dynamic brake locomotives on the on the uh, Mopac, except no, for on the not, not not a lot of grades. Yeah, the coal hauling routes out there with the SD forty two's that they had had those were beautiful. That's mm -hmm. that's that's great though. We we love the history. That's part of what makes this hobby so wonderful. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, moving to rolling stock, uh, we have a couple of uh, new paint schemes for our uh, one of our. Uh, popular uh, passenger cars, and this is our uh, open-sided excursion car. Yes. Um, you've seen this car in uh, Cass Scenic Railroad, um, and uh, some very, we, we've done various uh, painted on lettered versions, but we're uh, starting to introduce some more uh, uh, scenic railroad schemes to this car. Uh, we've got East Broadtop for this one, which um, if you've been following our uh, East Broadtop releases in the last couple of years, we've... Uh, Released a full uh, East Broadtop Consist in HO scale now with a uh, with a locomotive, uh, three of our old time cars and a bobber caboose. This is a perfect addition to that train. It sure is. Um, and then we also have Roaring Camp and Big Treats from California as well. Oh, neat. And uh, you know, obviously the uh, you know what what most modelers will know is that uh, these are narrow gauge railroads and this is standard gauge equipment. Um, and and of course we're well aware of that. Um, but you know the thing is. The amount of people who model in uh, HON30 or HON3, uh, you know, there, there's 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 not a lot of stuff out there in those scales right now. And if you want a memento from one of these railroads, uh, you want to remember your experience riding them by uh, having something on your layout. These cars are a perfect way to be able to do that. Yes, and that would look so great loaded up with people. That Absolutely, so yeah. And we have uh, we have a, actually a line in our uh, Scenescapes line of HO scale people uh, seated passengers that you could that would be perfect to sit in there. Perfect. So, moving on to freight cars and new tooling. Yes, I want to see how this turned out now. This, I think this is the first painted samples we've seen. Yes, so these are the first painted samples. We only have CSX Green Express right now, but these are the first painted samples of our 5161 Trinity Hoppers. Okay, that's hot. I like it. Look at that. All that. Oh, look at all the graphics on that. Yeah, this is a, a very, very nice car. Uh, it's uh, one, of the, one of the most uh, prevalent modern freight cars out there right now. Uh, this scheme um, is, uh, um, you know, it's a popular one among rail fans because it's just an interesting, vibrant scheme, like you said, with a lot of graphics. And, uh, you know, you can see it pretty much anywhere throughout the CSX system and beyond. Yes. That's going to be a very well-received freight car. Absolutely. We hope so. And uh, one of the interesting features to point out about this as well is it's got, uh, it's got see-through walkways up here. It's got all the brake rigging on the, uh, the the correct end of the car here. Wow. You've got the uh, you got the chutes underneath here. And 
yeah, it's just a, it's just a fantastic uh, modern car, and uh, you know the the uh, first of a couple of uh, uh, modern era freight cars that we've been introducing to the line. The other being the uh, uh, the air slide hopper. Yeah, and uh, also worth mentioning is uh, you know I've got two samples here, and the reason for that being uh, we're bringing these out in not one but two road numbers. Nice, I see. So, yes. Uh, traditionally, we've mostly brought out rolling stock with one road number. We're changing that up now. We're starting to introduce two where it makes sense. Um, Trinity Hoppers obviously run in trains um, with many more than just one car, so offering a second road number was a no-brainer for this car. Very nice. Very, very smart. Sure. Yes. So that's about all I have for HO scale right now. You will see in the background here, which I think has been the background in the last couple of times I've been on the show, which is our 44-tonner uh, models. Um, those um, should also be out and uh, shipping by the, by the time this airs, um, if not very soon afterwards. Tell me Absolutely. about that. Has that got sound in it, and has that that's DCC and sound? Yeah. So I'll I'll grab one of them here. This is the B and O. Okay, that's th that's nice. Okay. So this is uh, this is one of the schemes that we haven't done before with previous runs of this of this locomotive. So we've we've, we've got a few new schemes. We've got B and O. We've got Amtrak. Um, we've got a painted on leather black version um, because you know so many modelers are going to probably want these for um, using in their industries and stuff that you know that are specific to their layout. Um, so we wanted to be able to facilitate that. And, uh, yeah, these are, uh, un unlike any 44-tonner uh, that we produced in the past, these uh, have DCC and sound on board, and uh, that sound being uh, Tsunami 2 from Soundtracks, which is also, uh, it's also our first Tsunami 2 model. Yes, that's a high-quality sound system, and that is a very smooth little running locomotive. It is, absolutely. And, and let me tell you, the sound on these is fantastic. I, I, I listened to the startup sequence on this thing, <laughs> and, and uh, it was just, it was just like, you, you could almost smell the diesel exhaust. It was, it, was, uh, it, it was fantastic. That's awesome. And I saw the Santa Fe Tiger Stripe back there. Every time we do one of these interviews, I end up having to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just, just, just think of how it is working here. <laughs> best hobby in the world, and you've got one of the best jobs. <laughs> Um, so we got some end scale stuff here as well to show. Okay. Um, we've got the, these are the first samples of our uh, chemical tank cars. Now we brought out chemical tank cars uh, in HO scale a couple of years ago. Um, they've been doing very well. They're very popular cars. Um, they represent cars that I believe showed up uh, around the '60s and uh, '50s to '70s. Um, they're some of the first welded tank car design, or um, yeah, I guess welded tank car designs. Um, nice. This is uh, the uh, Hooker Chemical, which is one of the uh, you know, more popular, vibrant schemes that we had in HO, which we're also bringing to N scale. Okay. Uh, then we also have a scheme which is exclusive to N scale right now. And this is Penn Salt. And we have Diamond Chemicals. Very nice, yes. And we have, hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, Engelhard as well. Perfect. And uh, one of the nice things about these cars is you've got two different um, dome styles on here. You've got, uh, I'm not sure how well it's going to show on the screen, but you've got the, uh, the shorter, wider version here. Now, there is a specific purpose for, the, for these styles, which is, uh, is escaping me right now. Um, I believe it has something to do with the, uh, the, the types of chemicals or the pressurization. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the taller... Uh, thinner version here. So a couple of different styles here that are prototypically correct to the paint schemes that they the, 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 that the cars wear. Um, and then you also have uh, this is one of my favorite features as well. You have the uh, the little placards on here, the little um, yes. the diamond placards for the uh, for the chemicals. It's very cool. Sphere. There we go. You do pay attention to the details and the color schemes are nice. And it's nice when you've got one of those 1940s, 30s, 50 trains running. And you drop in a few colorful cars. It just breaks up a lot of the boxcar red that's passing you by. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, these cars can be seen uh, in these paint schemes up up uh, through the through the seventies. So uh, you've got a, a pretty wide range of uh, eras you can run these cars in. That's very very good, very good. And Amari National this month, everybody's excited about that. And then here comes oh, Christmas. Yeah. It's it's moving so fast, Matt. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, if you're if you're traveling to uh, Long Beach and you're going to the National Train Show, um, a lot of these samples, uh, a lot of these models are going to be available to want to look at in person at the show. That's very good. I love it when you come on and you share all the wonderful products with us, Matt. It's always a pleasure. And so with that, 
That is this segment for What's Neat. All of the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at broadway-limited.com. Bachman Trains, now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. Roca Prototype Models, we make it real. Check out their website at www.rocamodels.com.